Swiss theologian Oscar Kuhlman writes that the nicknames of the disciples give some clue that before joining Jesus' group, they had been in other groups, that this was not their first rodeo. Consider Julia, Judas Iscariot, and Iscariot were a group of folks called the Cutthroats. And then there were James and John, the sons of Thunder, the sons of Zebedee. And then there was Simon the Zealot. Uh, and the Zealots were an armed resistance group. And you remember later on in the story that Simon Peter carried a sword. So these were earlier resistance groups in Jesus' day. I believe that part of their willingness to follow Jesus, whom they understood the Messiah, the one who was anointed by God to rule Israel, because they wanted to overthrow the despots who'd been put in place by Rome and their cronies, the scribes and the Pharisees who were collaborators. Somehow, when you dealt with Jerusalem, you always came out a day late and a dollar short. And now with all the Son of Man talk and going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, this was not what they had signed up for. Can't you imagine them saying, I did not sign up for this. They wanted to turn the world upside down which meant that they would be on the top and not on the bottom. I think that was their reading of the last shall be first and the first shall be last. They wanted to be first next time around. And Jesus says, if any, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This was not what they had signed up for. They had resentment and wanted to see others on a cross. And there was a lot about the authorities in Jerusalem to resent. Not only did they hold the power, but they thought they were better than everybody else. So Jesus, who in the gospel always says what everybody else is thinking, remonstrates Jesus when Jesus speaks of suffering in Jerusalem, and Jesus responds, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I, I, I tend to psychologize, and when I hear these words on Jesus' lips, I really don't think that he's calling Peter, Satan. You know, the other places where Jesus talks with or to Satan and the devil is when he is tempted in the wilderness. So I understand this to mean that Jesus was himself tempted to avoid suffering and that he was talking to himself. You don't have to agree with me, but that's what I think. Jesus did not put himself first. He was willing to follow the voice of God even at personal cost. In fact, he understood himself to be the servant of all. And amazingly enough, the disciples stayed loyal to Jesus, to the end. They were not always praiseworthy, but they were loyal. They, to the cross and then onward into the life of the church, they too paid a price. Many paid with their lives, even though this was not what they had signed up for, they got into it and followed Jesus. Now, we always think of the official list of the 12 disciples. Um, 
and some people even memorized them. But I imagine that the group, in fact, was more fluid and included women as well as men, and that people came into it and people came out of it. And there may have been some who, when they realized all this Son of Man stuff, decided that this was not the right group for them. But you know, Simon the Zealot and the Sons of Thunder stayed with Jesus to the end. What do we make of this? Well, first off, Jesus was a team builder. While the mission was not what they thought at first, Jesus continued to teach, to motivate, to inspire them to something better. In my lifetime, the word disciple in church circles has evolved from being only a noun over to being a verb, you disciple others. And this is an ongoing process of conversation, accompaniment, motivation, inspiration, and teaching, helping folks internalize the values that we speak of together. This is part of what we do in church. Of course, Charles Manson is also spoken of as having disciples, so disciples is not foolproof. You still have to be wanting to do the right things. Another possible meaning is that circumstances change. And some folks rise to the occasion when things do not turn out as they hoped or imagined. I think of parents of children with special needs with intellectual, social, or physical challenges. I think of folks who hoped to be parents and then when they were not have become the servants of the community investing in other lives. I think of parents whose children have experienced untimely deaths, maybe even were shot dead, who plead for calm and the rule of law. It would be possible to be bitter, resentful, blaming everyone else for the circumstances, and of course, some people do this. But others rise higher while their life is not what they signed up for. They rise to love and loyalty through their pain. You know, circumstances change for almost everyone. I recently read a memoir by a Hmong woman, and in that I learned that one of the greatest blessings in that culture is to be born and to die in the same bed. Think on that. Kind of boring is beautiful. I think that's a culture where things have been disrupted all the time for a long time and it's been impossible to plan a future. I preached last November about the vine and fig tree. It's from Micah 4.4, 4, but they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees and no one shall make them afraid. This was a favorite scripture text of George Washington, and he wrote about it with some frequency. Uh, the image of both planting and then enjoying the fruit and calm. The more there are disrupted circumstances, when you fear to shop at the store, when you can't make plans for the future, when you are terrified of a traffic stop for your children, the more we realize that we need Jesus. In these circumstances, when we want to say, this is not what I signed up for, we can follow Jesus and rise to loyalty and love. Jesus is the one with the sense 
of direction. Jesus knows that genuine life is not about selfishness, rather a life lived in loyalty to God, to your loved ones, and to the larger community. A life with integrity and honesty and occasionally even a sense of duty. It is certainly not about personal material benefit alone. As Jesus said, for what will it profit them if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? Well, for Jesus and his immediate circle of disciples, loyalty to God meant suffering and death at the hands of others. For most of us, the stakes are not so high nor the result so stark, but we also can refuse to sell out to the temptation of personal benefit alone and live a life that joins Jesus' mission that is, if you will, a part of Team Jesus. This is a life of compassion and a life of service to others. You know, it's, it's kind of anti-intuitive in our present cultural moment, but a little suffering for a higher purpose is actually good for the soul. Amen and amen.